Hello and welcome to this section one video from Medic Mind, where we'll be focusing on BMAT section one assumption theory. My name's George, and today I'm going to be sharing with you some top tips about how to spot these assumptions within critical arguments. So there are threefold lesson objectives for today. First, we want to introduce you to what is an assumption. Second, we're going to tell you how to go about spotting it in the passage. And third, we're going to introduce you to the negative test, which is a little test we use here at MedicMind to help you spot that assumption a bit more quickly. So an assumption is an unexamined belief or unstated reason used to support a conclusion of an argument. And that means that the answer options will tend to focus on a statement that's taken at face value to be correct or definitive to occur without any evidence. In other words, it's almost an unstated premise, a link between the existing premises and the conclusion which isn't necessarily explicit, usually because it's almost common sense. And that means that it's often not stated in the passage and it must hold true for the conclusion to be reached. So you can ask yourself the question, what do you need to know in order to get to the conclusion? If the assumption is the unstated link between the premise and the conclusion, asking yourself this question can be crucial to finding out what it is. Second, you can ask yourself what isn't stated in the passage but is vital to the argument. An assumption will tend to underpin the whole of the argument together and therefore it will be the unstated vital linchpin of the argument. So another way you can spot the assumption is by going back to our argument theory. You can see above all arguments consist of a conclusion and that's the point that the author is trying to make. They're obviously underpinned therefore by evidence and that takes the form of one or more premises. And finally, there's a link between the two. A conclusion, therefore, is an unstated link between the premise and the conclusion. And that's the assumption. So you can hear, see here, this passage is briefly about Manchester United investing a significant amount of money in the transfer market so they have a good chance of winning the Premier League. You can see the conclusion are, is that they have a good chance of the Premier League. The premises is the fact that they've invested a significant amount of money. So the assumption in this case is that investing in the transfer market leads to a higher chance of winning the Premier League. In other words, the more money you spend, the more successful you will be. Now, the layman person might link those two in their head almost intuitively, but it, nonetheless, this is an assumption that the author has made in order to reach his or her conclusion. So let's do an example together. Pause the video now, have a think about this on your own, and then we'll go through the answer afterwards. So the first thing I'm going to do with this question is underline that we're talking about an assumption. I'm going to do that in blue right there. If we look at the passage, we're talking about cigarette smoking, and in particular 480,000 deaths per year. We then see the conclusion starting here. Less and less people are deciding to take up this once fashionable pastime. And the evidence they give for that is that the increased publicity of these stats in recent years has led to a shift. In other words, people are seeing these statistics and they're going away from smoking. And we're asked, what is the assumption? So if we look at the answer options, A, cigarette smoking damages the alveoli in the lungs. Well, that's not an assumption. We have nothing to do with the alveoli. It's almost taken as a premise that in the United States, cigarette smoking is responsible for these deaths. So actually, it's not an assumption to say that actually cigarette smoking is causing some damage. It's not the assumption the author's making. B, the health damage from cigarette smoking can't be reversed. Well, again, similarly, he doesn't talk about any sort of reversing of the health damage. Indeed, it's not necessary for this conclusion highlighted in green to follow. In no way does the reversibility of the smoking, the author implies, determine how many people are taking up this once fashionable pastime. So B is not correct. C, people are keen to avoid health problems associated with smoking. Well, this is the assumption. Hopefully you can see that it's talking about the health problems and the publicity of those statistics. And the conclusion is more people are going away from smoking. The unstated link there is that people are keen to avoid those health damaging effects. So altogether, He's linking the health damaging effects to more people turning away from smoking because he's assuming that people care about that. So yes, people are keen to avoid health problems associated with smoking. 
That seems to be the correct answer, and we can give that a little tick. D, the majority of people who get lung cancer can cite cigarette smoking as a cause. Well, that's not an assumption because it specifically says that 90% of those deaths are related to cigarette smoking. So all in all, C seems to be the correct answer. So let's look at the golden rule associated with assumptions. First, we start with a premise. We then add the assumption, because that's the unstated link, remember, in order to get to the conclusion. So if we reframe this with the example we just did, smoking is bad for your lungs, therefore you should stop smoking, basically is what the passage was just saying. The premise here is that smoking is bad for your lungs. The conclusion, or why the authors sat down to write, is that you should stop smoking. And the assumption, the link between the two, is that we care about our lungs. Otherwise, this wouldn't make sense. If we didn't care about our lungs, then we don't really care whether it's bad for our lungs, and therefore we wouldn't stop smoking. So this assumption here is the unspoken link that we care about our lungs. Onto our next example then. Pause the video now and have a go at this one. Okay, let's go through this together. I'm going to highlight again that this is an assumption that we're looking for. This one is slightly different because it's talking about a particular person. It's almost like a story. And you might not have seen these in the UK. They are rare, but they do crop up. So don't be phased by a sort of story-like appearance to the passage. We can see that an urgent client meeting is happening and therefore Johan decides to wake up an hour early. Okay, so he needs to arrive at a specific time and he decides to wake up an hour earlier. Now let's look at the passage answers. A. Johan enjoys working for his manager. Well, yeah, that seems to fit with why he wants to please the manager, but equally, he might just be in it because he knows he's going to get in trouble if he doesn't make this meeting. Indeed, it says he has long working days and an overall hectic and stressful lifestyle, so it doesn't really seem like the assumption is that he enjoys working for his manager. Indeed, he could be doing it for other reasons. B. Johan exhibits high level of stress. Well, yeah, it says he's got a stressful lifestyle there, but remember the assumption is the unspoken link. We have this written down right here, so that doesn't seem to be the assumption. C. Johan usually arrives into the office at 8 a.m. Now, this makes sense. If he usually arrives at, uh, usually arrives at 8 a.m., by waking up an hour early, in theory, he could arrive an hour early at 7 a.m. as expected. So the assumption here, the reason why he has to get up an hour early, is because normally he gets there at 8 a.m. So to get there at 7 a.m., he has to go an hour early. This is the unspoken link here, and we can give that a little tick. Finally, D, Johan usually arrives into the office at 6 a.m. Well, no, in that case, if he got there an hour before this meeting, he could afford to have an hour lie-in. So actually, D is incorrect. Going back to those two questions to help yourself identify the assumption, and we can slightly modify that. We can see what needs to be true for this argument to hold, really questioning what is the underlying assumption, why is this true, what needs to be true for this argument to hold, can really help. And second, you can ask yourself, what external knowledge do you need, or what external knowledge am I using in order to draw that conclusion? For example, in the Manchester United example, you could see the almost external knowledge you needed is that the amount of money that you invested is was directly proportional to success. So by questioning that external knowledge, you can help identify the assumption. Moving on to question three then. Pause the video now and have a go at this one. Perfect, let's go through it together. I'm going to highlight the fact that this is again an assumption, and you'll get bored of me saying that as the video goes on. On the left, we can see a bit of information about Alistair Cook right here and how he was the best English batsman to ever play the game. And I'm just going to highlight that right here in brackets, because that's almost the conclusion right up front. It says he was once captain of the side, but is enjoying his best form of his career now that he's no longer captain of that side. It's not really important right now. Analysts of the game use the number of career runs scored as an indicator of how successful the career of any batsman of the game has been. So this is a bit of premise. So he's saying that actually the more runs you have, the more successful you are. And that the conclusion is that Alistair Cook is the best England batsman to ever play the game. 
Okay, so if I just highlight in those traditional colors, you can see that this conclusion up here, the best English batsman is in green, that's the conclusion. The premise, which I'll put in purple here, is this sort of way they work out who is the best. So the link between them is what we're looking for, that's the assumption. So, A, Alistair Cook has more runs than any other English batsman. That does seem to be correct. We work on the premise that runs equals success and that we know the conclusion is that he's the best. So clearly he must have the most runs. And that's the sort of assumption that the author uses in this question. So let's give that a little tick there. B. Alistair Cook is no longer captain of the England team. Well, that's directly stated, as we said, in this little part in the middle here about his career no longer being no longer captain of the side. So actually that's stated, that's not an assumption. C. Alistair Cook disliked being the England captain. Well, that's not really essential for the conclusion and it's sort of a sideline information, so really not the correct one here. And D. Alistair Cook is a successful batsman. Well, that's clearly stated in the conclusion more than anything. It's not an assumption. So all in all, the correct answer here was A. Hopefully you got that. Don't worry if not. So the negative test is one of the crucial ways you can identify that assumption. Basically, it involves negating one of the answer options. In other words, you say, it is not true that in front of the supposed assumption. If that negative version of the assumption damages the argument, then you know you've found the correct assumption because it's the unspoken link that you've just damaged by putting, it is not true that in front of it. And this can help you easily spot the conclusion. Let's work through an example next. So here we have an example. Learning a foreign language helps people improve their social skills, so we should learn them. And we're asked, what is the assumption? Now, in this particular answer, there are two answer options. Either the assumption is improving social skills is desirable, or the assumption is we should try and study all subjects that improve our social skills. So let's apply the negative test to each of these in turn. If we take the first one, this is an example of how the negative test can work. Improving social skills is desirable, so let's flip it. Let's assume that it's not desirable and insert that between the premise and the conclusion. By doing that, we get the phrase, learning a foreign language helps people improve their social skills. Improving social skills is not desirable, but we should learn foreign languages. Clearly, that doesn't make sense. We've seriously damaged the argument, seriously damaged the link between the premise and the conclusion. Because now it just doesn't make sense. Why would we learn a foreign language if it helps us to improve social skills and we don't want social skills? It doesn't make sense. So this seems to be the correct assumption. If we do that in reverse for the other one, we can see we don't have to try and learn all subjects that improve our social skills. So now if we read this one, including the premise, the supposed assumption and the conclusion, Hopefully you can see that this doesn't really damage the argument at all. Learning a foreign language helps people improve their social skills. We don't have to learn all the subjects that improve our social skills, but we should learn foreign languages. It's clearly highlighting foreign languages as a key subject to learn because it helps us with social skills and the assumption that we had to try all subjects that improve our social skills doesn't stand up. So this is an incorrect option because it's not the assumption. So hopefully that let you see how the negative rule is applied in practice. We take one of the answer options, we reverse it so that it's a negative version of itself. And if that seriously damages the argument, then clearly we found the right assumption. So by using that sort of technique now, have a go at this question here, question four out of five, and pause the video now. Great, let's work through this one together. So the first thing I'm going to do is highlight that this is an assumption question. We then look towards the left, and hopefully you can see that this question is about the position of older siblings versus their younger counterparts. It says there's a link between being independent and particularly jobs such as investment banking and architecture, and that's predominantly in the older siblings because they seem to be more independent. And it says that they tend to earn much more than the children who are the younger siblings. It says that this research did not measure whether the relationship between the older sibling and earning more was dependent on the IQ, so it didn't consider anything to do with IQ. 
The younger siblings who had a career in show business and journalism were in the top 10% of earners in the United Kingdom. So it seems that those particular younger generation who have a career in show business and journalism seem to be almost exceptions to this rule because they're earning in the top 10% of the United Kingdom. This suggests that skills such as being independent exist at a greater proportion in older siblings than younger siblings. So altogether, what's he saying? Well, we know that his conclusion is right at the end there, that this suggests that skills such as being independent exist at a greater proportion for older siblings than they do for younger siblings. What's the evidence that he uses to back up that claim? The premise? Well, he talks particularly about this research paper. And he says the research did not prove the link to IQ, but did seem it is believed to be more likely to be due to independence. And since those higher paid jobs require independence, that's why the older siblings are being paid more. So altogether, those are the premises and those are the conclusions. And the bit about the sort of showbism and journalism in the middle there, if we highlight that, that seems to be more to do with an exception to this rule. He's more trying to sort of uh, separate out this particular anomaly group of younger siblings. So let's look at the answer options. A, being independent is not essential for a career in medicine or architecture. Well, that doesn't seem to be true. He says being independent is required for jobs such as investment banking and architecture. And you can see that right here in the passage. So actually that's not an assumption the author's making. B, younger siblings are guaranteed to secure a job in professions involving show business or journalism. That again, it isn't correct. He seems to be just pointing out this particular group of younger siblings as almost the exception to the rule. It's not anything to do with his major argument. So we can exclude option B. C, younger siblings who have a career in show business and journalism are unlikely to be intelligent. Well, we said that actually this research here is not dependent on their IQ. So all in all, this isn't measuring intelligence. He's simply talking about the link between independence and high earning and the fact that older siblings have more independence and therefore enter higher paid jobs. So C is incorrect too. And that leaves us with D, which we can just check now. A higher level of independent skills is not required for a job such as a news reporter or a celebrity. And that does seem to be the case. He says that younger siblings are the ones who go into these careers and that they don't really require um, a large amount of independence, whereas investment banking and potentially uh, architecture do. And he says that this career in show business and journalism, which is news reporter and a celebrity, that's almost, we said, was an exception to this rule. So he's almost saying that actually this is an exception because independent skills are not required for that job. Now we can apply the negative test and reverse that. So a high level of independent skills is required for a job such as news reporter or celebrity. Well, that would flaw the argument because that would mean that that exception painted in yellow here sort of flaws the whole idea that there's a link between older siblings, independence and high earners. So all in all, that suggests that D is the correct answer here. So another top tip that we have is sometimes you have to strip away and take away common sense and really get an argument back down to its basics by taking away any external knowledge. For example, if in our common reading every day, we make assumptions all the time without realizing. And sometimes that's because they're common sense and we do it almost subconsciously. So when you're approaching these questions, you almost have to approach them as if you really don't almost know how the English language works. You don't know any single external piece of knowledge whatsoever, because by doing that, you'll be able to spot where the assumption lies and not get carried away in your own common sense assumptions. Great, so let's try and put that common sense tip into practice with this example. This is our final example of today, so pause the video now and have a go. Right. So no points for guessing that this was an assumption question. And if we look on the passage on the left, we can see this is an unusual passage. It's one of those personal account story time style passages rather than necessarily a news report or article. So we've got to pay particular attention. 
we can see the passage focuses on this disagreement between Margaret's mum, who says you must go to university, and Margaret, who doesn't seem to understand this because she thinks that she could spend her time earning money outside of university, and it's her ambition to be as rich as possible. So that's almost our conclusion, she wants to get rich. Now, we've given them some information that Margaret's mum always knew what her true aspirations were and always told Margaret what to do to allow them to be realised. So it seems that this passage is getting at the disconnect between the conclusion, Margaret wants to be rich, the premise, Margaret's mum wants what's best for her, but it doesn't seem to make sense that Margaret's mum is telling her to go to university. So we have to find an assumption which makes this all make sense. Let's look at the answer options. A. Margaret ignores her mum a lot. Well, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't allow this argument to flow and make sense, so it's not an assumption of this particular argument. B. Margaret has a good mother. Indeed, it's sort of implied that anyway. You could argue it's an assumption, but it sort of directly states that Margaret's mum always knew what Margaret's true aspirations were and wanted them to be realised. So it's not really an assumption that she's a good mother because it's almost directly stated. C. Studying for a university degree equips an individual with numerous skills. Well, that would be a link if Margaret's main aim was to get these skills, but it's not, it's to make money. So it wouldn't make sense if Margaret's mum was justifying her uh, sort of demand to go to university if it was just to, to earn enough skills, because that's not what Margaret's interested in, and we're told Margaret's mum realises what she's interested in. So if we move on to answer option D, studying for a university degree improves the earning potential of the degree holder. Now you can clearly see how that's the assumption. We see that Margaret's mum is a good mum. She she's recognises the true aspirations and she tells Margaret what to do to allow them to be realised. But she's saying you must go to university because the university degree improves earning potential. And that allows Margaret to achieve her ambition. So D is the assumption which underlies what Margaret's mum is saying. And that's why it's the correct answer option here. So our take home points, we recognise what is an assumption and we talked about it being that unstated link between the premise and the conclusion. Second, we went through how to spot an assumption. And particularly third, we used the negative test in order to do that and narrow down between two answer options, which we think could be the assumption. And remember, that's achieved by flipping the answer option into its negative counterpart and seeing whether that really damages the argument. If it damages the argument, then that means that that answer option is the assumption. Okay, and that's that lesson complete. I hope that was helpful for you. My name's George, and I look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Thank you.